Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alaikum. Welcome to Newsroom. I'm your host, Ramah Khalidba. Today is the 20th of July, 2023. These are the stories that we will be discussing in detail during the course of the show. We'll begin with the latest situation as far as the rains and the monsoon in Pakistan is concerned. The number of deaths since uh, the monsoons, or rather the rains began, whether it be the pre-monsoon season or the monsoon season, has now touched around 100. There have been casualties uh, all across uh, Pakistan. And also, of course, we all know about the rivers uh, uh, whose beds have have also increased because of the incessant rains. Then comes uh, the deaths of the laborers uh, because of the falling of a uh, uh, sprawling compound that collapsed. The outer wall of that uh, compound collapsed due to which 12 people lost their lives because of rain-related incidents. Then there is a report by the International Rescue Committee that also says that uh, as a result of these rains, there could be further uh, food insecurity and, uh, of course, disease that could spread if necessary precautions are not being taken. This is going to be our first segment. Our second story of the day, ladies and gentlemen, concerns the Nuclear Security Index 2023 that has been published by the Nuclear Threat Initiative or the NTI, which has uh, put Pakistan at an overall position of 19 with 40, uh, with uh, of course 49 points, and uh, the fact remains that it has uh, come up upwards. Uh, the trajectory is uh, upwards for Pakistan, and it has come uh, above uh, other countries such as India. Now there are different statistics of uh, this report that have been put forward, and Pakistan has uh, fared much better in most of them. We will be discussing that in our second segment. Then we'll be talking about Sweden and how uh, uh, the protesters angered by the burning of copies of the Quran in Sweden stormed the Swedish embassy in Iraq. If we all remember, Salwan Mamika, an Iraqi refugee who is in Sweden, had burned pages of a copy of the Quran in front of Stockholm's largest mosque on the 28th of June during Eid al Azhar. Now, uh, of course, uh, there have been uh, retaliation of that, uh, and uh, even the Iraqi government has said that uh, uh, it will take uh, severe action against those who have been, been responsible behind this attack on uh, the Swedish embassy and that its ties with Sweden continue to remain as normal. Well, next, and uh, our last story concerns Pakistan Navy that has inducted two frigates, namely PNST Sultan and Shah Jahan. The contract for four multi-role frigates for Pakistan Navy had been signed between China and Pakistan in the year 2018. Now, two ships, namely uh, Tughril and Taimur, have already joined the Pakistan naval uh, fleet uh, last year. Now, this year, PNST Sultan and Shah Jahan also add to the fleet. Let's begin with our first segment, and that concerns the situation as far as rains and the monsoon in Pakistan is concerned. Uh, although uh, our uh, uh, government organizations, whether it be federal or provincial, as well as our armed forces, are working 24-7 to help those in need, nevertheless, there are, have been casualties as far as these rains are concerned. More in the following report. Climate change is supercharging extreme climate extremes round the world, a scorching weather gripped three continents, whipping up wildfires, torrential rains and threatening to topple temperature records. Pakistan is ranked among the top 10 most vulnerable countries on Global Climate Risk Index, even though it's responsible for less than 1% of global greenhouse gas emissions. The rains have returned a year after climate-induced downpours and undated at 1.13 of Pakistan, killing more than 1,700 people. The floods also caused $30 billion in damage last year. Since the first monsoon spell began less than a month ago, weather-related incidents have already claimed over 100 lives across the country and caused significant damage to property, crops and livestock. The rains have also swelled rivers in Punjab, swamping hundreds of villages and displacing at least 15,000 people. The Pakistan Met Department has warned that heavy rains might cause urban flooding in low-lying areas and might also trigger landslides in vulnerable hilly areas. The rains are aggravating the already tough conditions faced by communities affected by the 2022 floods at a time when the government is scrambling for funds for rehabilitation and reconstruction. Each new disaster forces thousands of children out of school, causes epidemics and leads to severe food shortages. So the world must realize what's happening in Pakistan and developing world due to climate extremes. Now, Fakar Shirazi, who is an expert in disaster response, joins us in the studios. Fakar, thank you very much to have joined us. First of all, let's talk about the 100 casualties that we've had since uh, these pre-monsoon rains began in the end of June and now, of course, we are uh, on the 20th of July. Are we prepared, in your point of view, to tackle the monsoon rains this year? It is a reality that climate change has started showing it its adversities, not only in Pakistan, but around the globe. 
But the matter of the fact is that 70 to 80 percent of the total rainfall of Pakistan comes from June to September. And 100 casualties right from June till uh, 20th of July, we are sitting in today. Uh, 100 casualties reflect that our infrastructure is not ready to sustain any such downpour in Pakistan. There were reports of electricity shocks, there were reports of trippings, there were reports of water logging. The people were though evacuated from riverside villages in many areas of Pakistan. But even then, 100 casualties is a great number. Mm and we'll have to reflect upon whether we are ready to sustain any downpour, which is a normal activity, which is not a paranormal activity. Mm. Monsoon is from centuries here mm. in this region, uh, rather from the known history. Uh, but why we are not able to uh, cope up with the situation? Has this situation always been there every year and we are only getting to know about the realities of it because of the advent of media and social media? I think that the situation has aggravated now uh, because of the climate change. We have uh, less reportings of cloud burst previously uh, before two or three decades, but it is happening more rapidly now in Pakistan. But even then we will have to have a resilient infrastructure because whenever such kind of uh, catastrophes happen, the marginalized groups of the society, the, the poor segments of the society, they are res less resilient towards them. Mm. And most of the time, they became, become victim of such incidents. Like we have heard one of the incidents in Islamabad, where 11 or 12 uh, laborers were... Uh, 11. 11. Mm. They, they, they were working somewhere in, in an underpass, and mm. it was uh, there was an accident, and 11 lives were taken. So I think there is a need of precautionary measures as well, as well as government will have to adopt a policy that if any such casualties of marginalized groups especially happen in such calamities, government will be providing some compensation to their families mm -hmm. to, to, to uh, support them getting out of this shock. Mm. That is true. You know, and you were talking of, of these 11 laborers in Lahore also, uh, five people, including two, two children, have been electrocuted in different yeah. You talked about yeah. that. You know, it's, there are certain uh, effects of these incessant rains, and that includes in, uh, electrocution. Now, uh, when you uh, look at uh, the situation as far as the rains and the monsoons are concerned, the Pakistan Med Department warns that heavy rains uh, will be happening in uh, the low-lying areas of uh, uh, city such as Islamabad or Rawalpindi and other urban centers, in your point of view, what are the measures that need to be taken in order to avoid urban flooding? Well, while we say that there was prior intimation, we always uh, think in our mind that prior intimation is for common masses. More than the common masses, in my opinion, the prior uh, intimation is for institutions to get their preparation work done, mm. to, to be ready for the rescue operation, to be ready for the evacuation of the people before the disaster happens, and to be ready for the food distribution and post-disaster uh, coping mechanisms. But we have seen uh, in many of the segments that there were compromises in uh, readiness of the, very, uh, of the institutions to, to, to provide support where needed. Hmm. Resultantly, the casualties happen. Hmm. But there is another part uh, to it as well. The, some of the institutions are working very well. We have heard reports that uh, 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 the forces were helping people hmm. in, 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 uh, in the water raising situation in Nalalai yesterday. Hmm. I think that rest of the department will have to put their foot down and they'll have to uh, have a better preparation in terms of providing rescue and relief response in terms of disasters. But there is a planning phase to it as well. Mm. So uh, it is a different debate. So, All right. Speaking of debates, what should be the roadmap to prevent further tragedies such as what we've heard, electrocution or the outer wall falling down on laborers who were sleeping? You know, these are incidents that can happen and could happen. How can we prevent those in the future? In particular case of electrocution, the electricity in Pakistan is distributed in any area of Pakistan, mm. is any of the distribution countries, uh, uh, companies. will have to make the companies accountable for such incidents mm. because it is not uh, a calamity. Mm. It is a disaster because of the human intervention. 
or because of the negligence of the human beings. So we'll have to make the companies accountable to prevent the people from such incidents. Moreover, we'll have to work on the infrastructure, then the early warning system, then providing the people with uh, required set of information, dissemination of information to the intended audience. That is the most uh, important factor. Uh, we we uh, transmit information, but we do not dis disseminate information. Mm -hmm. While we say dissemination of information, it is it means that the information reaches out to the, in to the intended audience. But in our case, we just announce it. Announcing it and the outreach of information to the intended audience is a different All phenomenon. Right. So these things need to be done and need to be tackled in order for uh, you know the people to be more vigilant and in order for also such strategy, uh, not strategy only not the to people, happen. But the institutions as well. All right. Uh, Vakar, also I'd like to, you know, w you say that these rains are because of climate change. We all know that. We've seen the floods last year also that created havoc and that was because of climate change. Now, the world promised uh, to give Pakistan 10 million US, uh, 10 billion US dollars, mostly in the shape of loans yeah. in Geneva, way back in January, yeah. to help the government's efforts for rehabilitation yeah. post the floods. We are again now, uh, you know, uh, uh, encountering floods. When, in your point of view, are we going to receive that development assistance or will we receive it? I think we will have to be cognizant of the fact that the priorities of the international community are different. All right. They are providing more assistance, I think hundreds of billions of dollars in Ukraine. While I have already said that, that the disaster in Pakistan, 2022 floods, affected more population than the Ukrainian incident mm. in Pakistan but the international community provided a cold, rather a cold shoulder to us. Mm -hmm. the, the, the pledges were there, the, the uh, 10 billion dollars is, is, is barely a, a, merely a mm -hmm. peanut for international mm -hmm. community, but that was even not actualized. So there is a little hope, we'll have to have more advocacy, though we pleaded the case in international community on uh, diplomatic juncture, very effectively, but even then, it seems that the priorities of international community uh, are different. So we'll have to focus upon further on the diplomatic juncture. We'll have to provide more information to the international community. The international community has been constantly saying to us that there are uh, issues with accountability. But since we have digitalized the system of distribution of ca cash, and rest of the information is available for accountability. I think this is merely an excuse by the international community. And I once again suggest that international community should reflect upon and they should be uh, providing us uh, with more support. Hmm. You know, another thing that concerns climate change uh, is the Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs as we call them. Recently, there was a fourth climate change and SDG synergy conference that was held in yeah. which Antonio Guterres, who is the United Nations Secretary General, said that the climate change was the 21st century greatest opportunity uh, to drive forward all the SDGs. Will that happen? I mean, well, is the world even understanding the importance of the SDGs and the importance of moving forward all initiatives that could, uh, you know, uh, uh, prevent further damages because of climate change? Omar, the sustainable development goals, they are for the globe. Hmm. And it is an established fact now that in a global village, uh, an intervention in any part of the world can have effects on in another part of the world. So the United Nations uh, compels or motivates its members to uh, provide their support in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. The Sustainable Development Goal 4 you have mentioned, and mm. I want to mention Sustainable Development Goal 6, mm. which is about water and sanitation and drainages and water recharge. And in, in a previous con Asia Pacific conference, I was over there in Nepal representing Pakistan. And coincidentally, we observed that in, in this Asian region, we were on the bottom in, in terms of achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 6 with respect to water recharge, availability of fresh water to a person, uh, provision of clean water, preventing your rivers, a drainage system and rest of the things. But again, the reason behind that was lack of financial assistance by mm. the international community to Pakistan to help in achieving the Sustainable Development Goal 6. 
So we once again uh, reiterate that and we insist that it is a common objective and we are living in a global village where one intervention in any part of the world will ha have certain effects in rest of the regions of the world. So we think that it is a joint venture and the national community will have to realize their responsibility in providing a support so that we can effectively uh, 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 help ourselves mm. and themselves in ach better achieving the sustainable development goals. Oh, there is another very important thing that is related to climate change, that is food insecurity. Yeah. Now, there was a report that was published in 2021 about the wheat yield and it said that the yield is going to decrease by around 16 percent and the mostly the countries that will be affected will be the developing countries. What should be the road map in order to tackle food insecurity? It is a long term uh, phenomena. Uh, it is not uh, only the developing countries, but uh, if you say in concrete words, Pakistan is the most affected country in the world by the climate change since the weather pattern has changed mm. and our staple food is wheat. Uh, so because of the early summers, the, the, the wheat crop cannot provide the required yield or the desired yield in many areas of Pakistan. Another phenomena which we have uh, augmented within that uh, food insecurity situation is a boom of uh, housing uh, sector in Pakistan where we have allowed many of the private housing companies that they are uh, building housing societies in arable areas of Pakistan in areas where are under command of different canals will have to have a policy that that does not permit any of the housing society to uh, to, to, to take land in any of the arable area, area of Pakistan since the arable land in Pakistan or in any country of the world is limited. Hmm. And our population is exponentially growing. So if the, the phenomena is coupled with the population growth with the land taken by the land grabbers, arable land taken by the land grabbers, and then the decrease in yield, this will definitely create a food insecurity situation in Pakistan. And as I have mentioned previously, that if any such situation happens in any countries, the frontline affected people are from, from the poor class, the marginalized groups. So with this regard, with the UN will have to have uh, uh, a positive role since mm. the stunting and wasting situation in Pakistan, the underweight prevalence in Pakistan, the malnutrition overall situation in Pakistan is one of the worst amongst the countries of the world. Mm. Uh, with 47 percent stunting rate, that is the uh, chronic malnutrition and uh, more than 28 percent uh, wasting uh, uh, prevalence, that mm. is acute malnutrition. Pakistan is also amongst the countries who are showing the highest uh, infant mortality rate in mm. South Asia. And of course, these so figures are very alarming, uh, Vakar, but at the same time, there's also another aspect to climate change, yeah. and that is the melting of the glaciers or the glob phenomenon, yeah. as we say. Yeah. There was a uh, report that came out also in 2021 by the University of Leeds that talked about the melting of the glaciers, especially in the Himalayas, that is uh, happening 10 times faster than it was used to happen in the previous centuries. Yeah. What are the risks that that poses also to Pakistan? After Antarctica, uh, we have the largest uh, reposits of of glaciers in the world. So with this regard only, we can be one of the most important countries for the international community to prevent the rapid climate change and to pre prevent the sources of fresh waters, mm. which are only 3 to 5 percent of the total waters available in the world. And as I, I have previously mentioned, international community support is required to prevent these glaciers. Because it's very important. Because it's a prerequisite. Yes, because there are now certain scientific techniques mm -hmm. that glaciers can not only be prevented, but they can be enlarged, they can be enhanced mm -hmm. with small techniques adopted by the local community. Mm -hmm. These kind of projects are needed in the northern areas of Pakistan, but international community will have to put their efforts and their resources in so that we can protect this source of fresh water for the world. Mm. As I have mentioned that we are the second largest source of glaciers in the globe after Antarctica. So it shows uh, upon our uh, significance in the world. The only compromise 
or, or, the, or the only driving force missing is finances. And since we know and everybody knows that we are suffering from a financial crunch, we are looking towards the international community for that support. But the support of the international community isn't coming as it should be, in fact. Definitely. Uh, it seems that the pri their priorities, the priorities have changed. changed. Yes. All right. Now, also, uh, let's talk about the temperatures that are heating up as well. The United Nations predicts that the next five years are going to be warmer and warmer yeah. with each passing year. What is in this, uh, if, if, you know, if the world continues to warm itself up, heat itself up in the coming years, what is the future of the planet if we don't take necessary action? It was said in the, uh, it was reiterated in the COP27 conference that we are committed to uh, our goal to uh, keep the uh, climate uh, or the temperature change less than 2 degrees centigrade. Mm. But the world has constantly been contributing in emission of uh, greenhouse gases. Mm. And what are the greenhouse gases? By greenhouse gases, we mean that these gases trap the heat within themselves within the outer air pocket of the, of the, of the globe. Mm. And most important of these is carbon and then methane and ethane and rest of the. So many of the sectors contribute to it. First of them is the fossil fuel emission, and then the, the agriculture and use of pesticides and machineries. Then again, the air conditioner, the refrigerators and, and rest of the equipments, they are all used by human beings around the globe. Mm. But since we are a developing country and our per capita income is not such high, the per capita holding of personal vehicles is very low in Pakistan. So we claim and international community accepts that we contribute less than 1% of the total carbon emission of the world. So world will have to realize that which are, which are the countries that the, the price of their development their industry, their uh, products, their fossil fuel emissions is paid by rest of the countries of the world. They will have to buy the carbon credits from the developing countries who are less contributors of the car carbon emissions and who are investing in afforestation. One of, con uh, of, the, uh, of the countries is Pakistan. We mm. have been investing huge amounts mm. in afforestation in last decade. Mm. So I think that we uh, uh, we, we, we can claim that world, world need to realize our contribution. Mm. And, and the world needs to make the necessary assistance, to give the necessary assistance to Pakistan so that, you know, Pakistan can also grapple with all the effects of yeah. climate change that it has seen in the past years that it will continue to see as per all the reports that are coming forward. Thank you so very much, Vakar Shirazi, uh, expert in disaster response and so many other things that I hope we'll be discussing in the future as well uh, to be here in the series and to discuss the impact of the monsoon rains to Pakistan and of course how the climate change is directly and indirectly affecting Pakistan in terms of disease, in terms of food insecurity, in terms of uh, other uh, disasters uh, as well. Thank you so very much to have joined us. Let's come to our second segment ladies and gentlemen and that concerns the Nuclear Security Index 2023 published by the Nuclear Threat Initiative otherwise known as the NTI. Now it puts uh, Pakistan at number 19 overall with around 49 points. There are different sub divisions in, in that report and of course whether it be the quantities of site that include the quantities of nuclear material, sites and transportation, material production, elimination trends, whether it be security and control measures on site physical protection, control and accounting procedures in site threat prevention, physical security or uh, during transport response capabilities, cyber security, security culture, whether it be the global norms on international legal commitments, voluntary commitments, internal assurances, nuclear country, INF, FX, or it, whether it be domestic commitments and capacity or risk environment. There are different subsections of this very important report and Pakistan now has climbed up the ladder as far as its statistics and its presence in this report is concerned much above uh, India. Now it is number 19 and with uh, 49 points in total just to give you a little uh, insight the quantities of nuclear material as far as that subdivision is concerned Pakistan comes at number 14. We have been joined by Dr. Adil Sultan who is the Dean of the Department of uh, Aerospace and Strategic Studies. 
AI University uh, and we will be discussing with him the different aspects of uh, this uh, Nuclear Security Index 2023 and the importance for it for uh, Pakistan. Dr. Adil, thank you very much to have joined us. It's an important topic and uh, something that a lot of us don't understand really the nitty gritties of. What are the key improvements in your point of view as far as this NTI index is concerned, the Nuclear Security Index, as far as Pakistan's nuclear safety mechanism is concerned? Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me. First of all, I think I should give you a background about this nuclear security index that NTA publishes every two years uh, for four years. Uh, this started after Obama's uh, initiative for nuclear security to enhance global nuclear security uh, efforts. So the NTA basically it's an NGO, so it publishes this. Uh, Nuclear Security Index based on the information which is openly available uh, to everyone. Uh, Pakistan doesn't officially participate uh, uh, in this uh, by sharing information because uh, as a matter of principle, uh, Pakistan has maintained that uh, NGOs, they do not have the right to judge or assess any country's nuclear security credentials. Because nuclear security remains a national responsibility, and it is the governments and the NGO should not be holding governments accountable for this. So that was the whole background. But now coming to this report, uh, there have been significant improvements in Pakistan's credentials over the past uh, several years. And if you see these reports and the previous one also, the, the graph has gone gradually upwards, and there has been improvement every two years. Uh, the most improved, that is about domestic commitment and uh, capacity building of, uh, in terms of nuclear security. So as a responsible nuclear state, Pakistan has certain uh, responsibilities that it has uh, indicated through various conventions and uh, agreements and with its engagement with the IAEA. So in terms of those commitments, uh, that it will, what steps it will take at the domestic level to enhance its nuclear security, I think that the, uh, the good point is that it is the most improved segment, and which is something uh, we must, must appreciate. All right. Dr. Adil, I'd also like to understand nuclear uh, security is also a prerequisite to many important reports of organizations such as the FATF. And of course, we are now out of the gray list of the FATF as well. Do you feel this is also equivalent to Pakistan's global recognition as a responsible nuclear state? Absolutely, absolutely. Because as I, uh, uh, notwithstanding what I said about the NGOs, uh, NTIA is a credible institution, and it evaluates uh, nuclear security credentials of all the nuclear weapon states and the states that have some nuclear material that is certain quantity and more, and they are nuclear sites. So amongst those countries, uh, I think uh, Pakistan's uh, performance has been uh, very good. And it also speaks of the seriousness that Pakistan uh, gives to the nuclear security issue. All right. Dr. Adil, uh, comparing Pakistan to our not-so-friendly neighborhood country, India, which continues to perform uh, abysmally as far as the Nuclear Security Index is concerned, do you feel the world is finally uh, trying to recognize or has recognized Pakistan's long-standing concern about India's nuclear capabilities and its uh, disregard for nuclear security? This is interesting. Uh, I, as an academic, do not like to bash any other country for their nuclear security credentials, uh, especially our neighbor India. But in light of the perception that is prevailing uh, amongst the international community that India has an impeccable nuclear security record or safety record, this report indicates for the last three consecutive reports, India has made no progress. So they, have, they haven't earned any single point in terms of various commitments and in terms of nuclear security credentials. So India is now uh, standing on top of Iran. So after Iran, there is North Korea. So that is something to worry because the way India is expanding its nuclear, weapon, uh, nuclear program, including the nuclear weapons program, and several countries are helping India. So it's a point of concern that India probably is not taking its nuclear security commitments uh, very seriously. And being a regional country, uh, India lies in this part of the world. So anything happens uh, in terms of nuclear uh, security or safety incidents, uh, the region would be affected. So this is not a point for, uh, to just to uh, 
uh, this is not for the point scoring, but this is a serious issue that we but all need to... I mean, here also we are not trying to point score, Dr. Adi, we are just trying to lay bare the facts and trying to understand what should the world response be towards India. Uh, and, you know, adding to India, I am really sorry, but there are so many things that concern nuclear security in India. Uh, the recurrent incidents of uranium theft, theft, uranium smuggling in India, we have seen the reports, I have talked about it in the past as well. They also highlight the uh, poor security arrangement as far as uh, India's nuclear arsenal is concerned. What are the serious loopholes in your point of view from an academician's point of view, as you yourself have said, uh, as far as India's security mechanism? and nuclear doctrine is concerned and what needs to be done by India in order to improve that? Yeah, uh, doctrine is something else but we are talking here nuclear security. So in terms of nuclear security, the incident that you highlighted, it speaks of that uh, India is not taking its uh, commitments made to the international community, community very seriously in terms of domestic commitments or the capacity building. And that is why we continue to hear about these incidents, that uh, uh, the reports about these incidents coming from India about nuclear theft. And I think this NTI report has also indicated that, that there are serious concerns about nuclear security in India and safety issues also. Dr. Adil, you know, adding to that, I'd, I'd really like to have your point of view and what needs to be done by our neighborhood countries in order to make them more secure as far as uh, their nuclear material is concerned. There is also, uh, you know, illegal trade of nuclear technology and material uh, as far as India is concerned and uh, important reports from international and uh, national organizations have also come forward as far as that is concerned. Uh, how uh, much of a concern is it for uh, uh, any actor concerned within India and in the region? Yes, I said it is a point of major concern because we are talking about nuclear security. Mm. So the point that uh, you highlighted that what India needs to do uh, it's simple that they need to take this responsibility seriously. They need to strengthen their domestic controls. They need to have this independent regulatory mechanism that India doesn't have for now. Uh, so there are big loopholes in India's nuclear management uh, structure. So that report highlights those loopholes or gaps. And this report uh, also, in, if the country, they take it seriously, it also suggests certain measures for each individual country, how you can improve your a ranking by taking certain measures and I think if India just uh, they go down the support they will find the answers what are the shortcomings in the nuclear security credentials. But Dr. Adil, I hope they really will understand the concerns that need to be addressed and they address them uh, uh, with all the interest possible. But this said, the, uh, you know, if you remember well, in March, uh, on the 9th of March last year in the Mian Channu area of Punjab's Khanewal district, uh, there was a missile that landed, that struck a building in the Pakistani territory from India. Now, uh, Pakistan has asked for a joint probe uh, with India as to what were the causes that uh, led to this missile uh, landing in Pakistani territory and thank God it wasn't uh, armed with any nuclear material. Had it been, it would have been a nuclear incident and could have started a war between the two nations. Uh, what uh, in your point of view needs to be done by India as far as this is concerned? How important in your point of view is it also for India to collaborate with Pakistan in order to have a joint probe to understand or to ascertain the causes of this missile? It, the, that episode uh, is a slightly different one because this report essentially deals with the nuclear facilities and materials and mostly in the civilian uh, domain, uh, which is a responsibility for all states to give transparency also to demonstrate how serious they are about nuclear security. Now, once we come towards the weapon side, that's an uh, issue of command and control. Uh, the, we do not know nuclear weapon states. They provide transparency in terms of nuclear weapons and their command and control. And this is not the uh, scope of this report also because that's a sensitive issue. No country provides that kind of transparency. But having said that, uh, referring to that episode, I have always maintained that it was a failure of India's command and control. Although uh, many Western scholars say it was not a nuclear missile, but uh, it was a strategic missile. And between two nuclear armed states, such kind of a mistake can quickly escalate to a serious crisis if Pakistan had not acted responsibly. So that is a big question mark on India's nuclear 
weapons management system or its missiles management system, that's a big question mark that the international community needs to uh, take into cognizance. And Pakistan has been highlighting that. Of course, we have been demanding that uh, ha let's have a fair investigation so that we feel confident that you are managing your nuclear assets or your strategic missiles uh, uh, well. But, of course, India will never agree because it uh, doesn't accept a assessment mistake. It just fired uh, mid-ranking officials and it said uh, the story is over. Uh, that is up to the international community and especially states who are helping India build its uh, military muscle, especially in the nuclear and conventional war. They need to be asking these questions from India. So we are helping you, and what are you doing uh, to demonstrate that you are a responsible country and you will not uh, do anything irresponsible that can inadvertently lead to a serious crisis in this region? All right. Uh, Dr. Adil, uh, now that we are approaching, of course, nuclear security and we are highlighting this in this segment, what are the factors in your point of view that determine nuclear security, training, equipment and approaches to a screening personnel? And in your point of view, what are the requirements for nuclear material accounting and control and the approaches for strengthening this nuclear security culture that is so prevalent and important for regions such as ours? There are several conventions, international arrangements, and also the procedures stipulated by international atomic energy agencies. So all countries which have certain uh, nuclear facilities or certain uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, HEU or plutonium, which is weapon usable material, uh, they, uh, there are guidelines how to secure that material, and there are guidelines by the IEA to secure the civilian nuclear power plants or the facilities and the civilian material, everything. There are procedures for everything, and all countries, who have these kind of capabilities, they are signatory to certain conventions also, and uh, they have taken upon certain uh, obligations also as part of the Nuclear Security Summit, which President Obama uh, held uh, before uh, the summit that we had. All countries, they share how they, uh, because it's uh, in the end, it's a national responsibility, but the kind of domestic measures, the safety and security measures, the kind of... Uh, uh, facilities that you build and the kind of security arrangement that you do. Like we have this uh, uh, whole pub, uh, uh, national security division, which uh, is responsible to protect all the nuclear facilities inside Pakistan. And then we have this training academy also, because nuclear security is a specialized team. So Pakistan has this uh, academy where they train their people to deal with this issue. So I, uh, most of the countries, uh, because nobody wants such an incident to happen on their territory, because then they would be labeled as irresponsible countries. So there are measures, there are systems uh, that the countries have to institute. Uh, so all countries understand. So this, this is not something that India doesn't understand. India is a fast-expanding nuclear program, both civilian and the military. And we have continued to hear about this, that India has an impeccable nuclear safety and security record. But consistently we see that India is lagging in this, and this NPI index is one evidence of that, that India needs to do more. Of course, now and, and now speaking as a strategic analyst, I'd also like to understand now that India is part of so many important conventions that uh, include it in the Asia Pacific program of uh, countries such as the US or uh, uh, you know other important uh, developments as far as the strategic importance of India is concerned. It has increased manifold in under those circumstances. Shouldn't India's nuclear security bit or be of uh, you know primordial importance to all the countries that be as you have yourself said earlier. Uh, this said, I would also like to understand this obsession with nuclear nationalism that countries like uh, India have under this new Hindutva regime, the BJP regime. How, that, how can that be also counted at the same time as providing the adequate facilities for nuclear security in India? Uh, whose role is more important? Is it countries such as the US, the European Union? Is it those countries uh, that are also very concerned about uh, nuclear safety and security like Japan? Wh who can put pressure on India in your point of view? Nuclear security, uh, unfortunately, for the past several years has been politicized. And uh, we have seen that Pakistan was often 
the victim of this narrative that was promoted basically by our neighbor and uh, in Washington circles because they wanted to uh, extract political concessions elsewhere. So they always brought out this nuclear security issue of Pakistan. Uh, notwithstanding what Pakistan did, and Pakistan, whatever Pakistan did, it did for its own interest. Because as a responsible country, the kind of systems that we have institutionalized and the system that, or the measures that we have taken, we took it not to demonstrate to the rest of the world that, look, we are a responsible country. We did it because we thought it is necessary uh, for our own people also. And if we have the nuclear weapons and nuclear uh, facilities, this is our national responsibility. Uh, unfortunately, this continues to remain politicized, and that is why you don't see any criticism on India, because India is on the right side of the Western power. So any errors or omissions that India does, nobody points that uh, finger towards India. That is very unfortunate. I hope that, you know, that situation changes because at the end of the day, nuclear security is extremely important for the future of our generations, whether they be in this part of the subcontinent or the other part or in any other region uh, thereof. And uh, those uh, powers who uh, call their, themselves nuclear powers should also be extremely responsible as far as nuclear security is concerned. Thank you so very much, Dr. Adil Sultan, Dean of the Department of Aerospace and Strategic Studies at the Air University, talking to us and highlighting all the different aspects of this uh, Nuclear Security Index 2023 in which Pakistan has gained many points on many different sub-issues of this report and of course India has gone down in this uh, ranking. The fact also remains that Pakistan's score is 61, it has gained 4 points, India could also only manage 52 points. Uh, overall score of Pakistan is of course 49 which is higher than India that has scored 40. Iran has scored 29, North Korea has performed with 18 uh, points. Nuclear security, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we need to highlight also more uh, on our medias, whether it be social media or uh, uh, traditional media such as ours, in order to for people to understand the importance of all of that. Pakistan is an extremely uh, responsible nuclear state and will continue to have that under all the protocols that it has implemented in place. I hope and I wish that other countries such as India also implements such protocols. Let's come to our last two stories uh, very quickly. The first concerns Sweden. We all remember Remember uh, uh, Salwan Mamika, the Iraqi refugee uh, who uh, uh, immigrated to Sweden a couple of years back and now asked uh, the, the, the authorities in Sweden that he wanted to burn the Quran in order for highlighting his point of view. Uh, on uh, freedom of speech and expression and of course uh, the, what he thought of the Quran is and he therefore burnt the Holy Quran after having had the uh, accord of the authorities in Sweden on the 28th of June during Eid al -Azhar. The timing was extremely important and the timing was extremely perturbing. First, you burn a holy book. Second, you do it uh, when it is the period of the Hajj and Eid al -Azhar. Uh, The whole, uh, uh, this whole incident sparked debate. This was not the first time that this has happened, but this has happened at a very important juncture. At a juncture where uh, Muslims, whether it be in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir or Palestine or other where, are, are being brutalized. And at the same time, we see nationals in other countries desecrating our holy book. Where it comes to our religion, that is Islam, ladies and gentlemen, we have always considered all our holy books to be extremely important and equally important. Of course, our holy book remains the Holy Quran, but all the other holy books are equally important. And we have never had a desecration of any holy book altogether. Now, what has happened as there have been very various reactions, but the most serious of these reactions has come in Iraq, where the embassy of Sweden was uh, stormed by uh, people. Uh, as a result of this heinous incident of the burning of the Holy Quran, all the embassy staff, thank God, were safe. But the Swedish Foreign Ministry press office also confirmed that in a statement. Iraq's Foreign Ministry also condemned this incident and said that uh, the government has instructed the competent security authorities to conduct an urgent investigation and take the necessary security measures in, uh, on the perpetrators of this act and hold them accountable as per the law. A statement also later on Thursday from the Iraqi government said it will never uh, severe the diplomatic ties with Sweden if a second Quran burning does take place in the country. On the one hand, diplomacy is very important. On the other hand, it's also very important for countries and uh, their policies to uh, include uh, the respect 
of uh, other religions and the respect of the holy books. I hope the people understand that across all the countries. Respect of you know, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, religion, I understand. But there is a limit to everything. Do we talk of anti-Semitism? Do we talk of uh, you know, uh, 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 all those aspects that uh, concern Israel or uh, the Torah? No. Uh, is it burnt? Is the Bible burnt anywhere? No. Why is it just the Holy Quran? A lot of questions emanate from that. I hope the people will ponder on that. Finally, the Pakistan Navy, ladies and gentlemen, has included two new frigates that are the PNS Tipu Sultan and the PNS Shah Jahan. Uh, there was a contract with China that was made in 2018 for four frigates, two of which uh, Tughril and Taimur have already joined the Pakistan Navy. And now the two new frigates, PNS Tipu Sultan and Shah Jahan, have added to uh, Pakistan Navy's fleet. Now, these ships are uh, technologically advanced. They are uh, surface to surface, land attack, uh, surface to air, underwater firepower. Uh, and with, they have also extensive surveillance potential. And that is very important under this current state of affairs where Pakistan or any other country needs to strengthen its uh, geostrategic positioning. And I think uh, Pakistan's Navy is extremely competent and the addition of these frigates will add to its strength and its uh, importance as well. The development of these state-of-the-art naval units for Pakistan Navy is also, also hinged on modern, modern stealth design. We all need to be updated with all the modern technology and that is what Pakistan Navy has done. These ships, as the Pakistan Navy always does, will provide deterrence while contributing to protecting our sea lanes uh, of communication. And this is what our uh, um, naval forces have been doing. We have thwarted many an attempt by uh, other uh, neighbors or other countries who have uh, been hostile and in a very prominent and strong fashion. We wish the Pakistan Navy all the best and congratulations for the induction of the PNS Tipu Sultan and Shah Jahan. With that, we come to an end of today's newsroom. We'll see you inshallah tomorrow with stories and segments that pertain to you, us and Pakistan. Allah Hafiz.